off we go. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to today's live CNCF live webinar. Let's talk about innovation and open source container developing developer tooling. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm going to read our code of conduct and then hand over to Phil Estes, principal at Amazon Web Services. A few before we get started during the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee, but you can pop all your questions and comments into the chat box and we'll get to them um, as soon as we can. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They're also available via your registration link you used to join us today and will be on our online programs YouTube playlist. With that, I will hand things over to Phil. All right. Thanks so much, Libby. Um, sorry for the delay in getting started. Um, as usual, there's always technology fun. And so uh, my colleague here at AWS, Chris Short, is driving the slides because my uh, system refused to play well uh, with the uh, Bevy tool. So, um, and I had kind of hoped to show some demos of Finch. I don't know if we'll figure that out when we get there, but for now we'll, we'll dive in. Uh, and thanks again for, for hanging on while we got things started. Um, so yeah, today I, I first, I think we'll start with some background. So it makes sense why we're still uh, talking and innovating around container developer tooling, uh, you know, command line clients, uh, how you actually build and run and talk to registries uh, when you're working with containers. Uh, so why don't you hop to that next slide, Chris? So it's been exactly uh, 10 years um, since the Docker command line was uh, famously demoed by Solomon Hikes at, uh, I believe it was PyCon in April of 2013. Um, and it's forever immortalized on the internet with his misspelled hello world, uh, which had the crowd laughing uh, along with him. Um, but, you know, we've come a long way in 10 years. Uh, next slide. And, you know, for the most part, uh, I assume if you're building containers, um, yes, there uh, has been some amazing work by Microsoft to have Windows containers. But, you know, when we started this journey, um, you know, people were building for a Linux platform. And so the the concepts that that make up containers, again, if we ignore Windows for a minute, um, are all, of, all about Linux uh, technologies like namespaces and C groups. And these were uh, pieces of the, of the Linux kernel. And uh, I just saw uh, Chris disappear, which means our slides have disappeared. Uh, so hopefully he'll come back in a minute. Yeah, oh, here he is. <laughs> Apologies. No problem at all. Uh, so I assume we get those slides back in a second. Um, yeah, so if we go into the next slide, um, you know, we've been building uh, containers for Linux, and it's not just that these kernel features are critical to, you know, the even the concept of what a container is, this process that's isolated in very specific ways, but there's other technologies we've added to that around uh, security, like SE Linux or AppArmor, or SecCom profiles, um, how images are even constructed, this idea of layers uh, and these, these file system constructs uh, of copy or on, on write file systems and the Linux capability system. These are all very uh, integrated into our concept of what containers are. And so we're used to building and operating containers in the context of Linux. Uh, next slide. But, uh, you know, the interesting question is, what what's that system that you sit in front of every, every day? Is it Linux or is it a Windows machine? It's many times dependent on your employer. 
and you know the the machine that they have is a common build that, that developers get in your company or a, a preference that you have for you know having a macbook uh, like many people do these days uh, next slide if you try and look for data it's it's pretty tricky so i i you know distilled a lot of my uh rabbit trailing down to some some averages um, mac os and windows you know again you can quibble about specific percentages but uh, potentially up to 80 percent of developers aren't using linux at work and so when we marry these two things we've discussed you know what what's that system that that i'm that my keyboard is attached to uh, that i work with every day and where where am I trying to run containers that I'm building and testing in my local environment, mostly targeting Linux? Uh, there's a mismatch there. Uh, next slide. So you know we are, now we're struck with this problem. I, I want to work with Linux containers, but I'm not on Linux. And a very easy solution that many people, including myself, used for for years was, well, I can, you know, just have Linux in a VM somewhere. I can I can use it in the cloud. I can run, you know, a software like Parallels on my MacBook or on my Windows system, or I can use VMware. Um, and and yes, I mean, this, this is definitely a possibility. Now I'm running, you know, whatever that container software is, the Docker engine or Container D or Creo on a Linux system, and I interact with it by having this VM and, you know, maybe there's some complexity around now I have to SSH in or I have to share file systems across this boundary and it, it becomes a little less easy to do my work. Uh, next slide. And of course, you know, once we've added this um, solution, so to speak, we've brought new problems to ourselves because we, we now don't only have our laptop or our our workstation and all the management that's either required by my employer or the fact that I'm just trying to keep it up to date. But now I have another OS image that has its own CVEs and flow of updates. And I have to, you know, if I get my system replaced, you know, I either have to preserve my VM image or configure it back the way I wanted it. And then I've already mentioned there's the whole issue around VM boundaries um, you know, I, I have an IDE on my Windows or Mac system, but I want to share those files I'm editing into the VM so I can build it, you know, in my Docker file into a container. And then networking and all kinds of other complexities of having essentially two systems. <clears throat> so the, all this boils down to I, I, I potentially inhibit, you know, just having a, a streamlined workflow because of the difference of what's on my host versus what's inside this VM with, you know, commands or scripts or tools that I like to use. And it just creates complexity there. Next slide. So, uh, you know, Docker recognized this early on and uh, initially created a project called Docker Machine that was pretty popular that tried to hide some of the complexities of running this VM on your behalf. That then was developed into a more complete uh, project called Docker Desktop that uh, has continued on to today into an actual licensed product from Docker that they continue to develop and add extensions to. And again, for, for anyone in the sort of Docker ecosystem, this is a welcome um, addition to how to operate with containers no matter what operating system I use day to day. Next slide. Um, and again, there's tons of benefits there because now, again, I'm back to this, this perception that it's just seamless. I just run commands and I don't worry about that there, where there's a VM and who's managing what's inside the VM and how the pass-through magic happens. And also it gives them a chance to bundle relevant or related tooling. So kubectl and, and a local Kubernetes cluster and Docker Compose and all, all the other pieces that may be valuable to your workflow uh, 
are there within this uh, collection of projects that manage this on your behalf. Next slide. So that's great. Um, you know, again, if you're if the Docker ecosystem is is where you work and operate. Meanwhile, you know, across the last seven, eight, nine years, um, additional ideas around how we assemble container runtimes, what they look like, what they contain. Uh, I'm a maintainer of the CNCF Container D project, so obviously I spend a lot of my time focused on the Container D ecosystem. Uh, there's Podman and Creo uh, coming out of, of Red Hat and, and a suite of tools that go along with that. And then, you know, I threw in even sort of the HPC community and work they've done to develop um, container runtimes, uh, which again, are have a lot of the similar um, capabilities of building a container, you know, running a container, pushing it to a registry. Uh, but these are, you know, all potentially incompatible with um, specifically the, the Docker desktop product or, or ecosystem around it. Next slide. So, um, you know, again, as I said, as a maintainer of Container D, that's where I spend most of my time. Uh, it's now a graduated project with a mature user base. And there's a lot of sub projects around it. It's not just the one runtime. There's custom file system support. There's an image encryption project. There are people who now, you know, want to integrate Container D with, uh, pieces and, and software platforms built around Rust. And so there's Rust crates to tie into Container D either as a uh, runtime or via the gRPC API. Uh, there's C group projects. Um, and then uh, one that I really want to highlight that's going to play into the, our discussion today is NerdCTL was created uh, just a couple of years ago to uh, provide something that Containerd didn't have when we created it, and that is a compatible set of command line uh, flags and subcommands that match the Docker command line interface. Uh, now, additionally, it's important at this point to mention BuildKit because Containerd also uh, wasn't created with the idea of encapsulating the whole concept of assembling a container. Uh, again, the traditional way being using a Docker file, running it through Docker build and getting a container that you can push to a registry. And so BuildKit is that project that came out of Docker uh, as its own open source project, has uh, expanded its capabilities. It can build around run C, it can build on container D. Um, and so together, having BuildKit plus NerdCTL provides two sort of missing pieces in the Containerd ecosystem around having that compatibility with, for example, the Docker command line. Next slide. So um, we're kind of back to where we started in that, um, well, that's great. Containerd is a Linux project. BuildKit is a Linux project. Uh, but what's the solution when I'm back on my Mac or uh, potentially on Windows uh, and I still want to use these projects to build and run containers in my local development environment? So I've already mentioned NerdCTL provides that Docker compatible command line. It also has Compose support. So all the, all the commands around Docker Compose that you would expect are there. And then Lima is this missing piece that uh, was created by one of our Containerd maintainers, Akihiro uh, Suda created Lima, which is now also contributed into the CNCF as a sandbox project, uh, uses QMU for virtualization. And he wrote it specifically, uh, again, his own use case was, I have Containerd, I want to put it inside a VM and on my Mac, just get this simple pass through both for file sharing and handling the commands and the flags, uh, all passing through to NerdCTL and Containerd and BuildKit inside the VM. Now you can use Lima for a lot of other use cases, but again, his personal use case uh, was around this idea of uh, 
similar to Docker Machine or Docker Desktop, providing the same pass-through experience. So it feels natural to run uh, NerdCTL or ContainerD commands on your host and have all the management of the VM and the pass-through handled on your behalf. Uh, the cool thing is that because ContainerD, as I mentioned, has other sub-projects, Lima plus NerdCTL plus ContainerD uh, has allowed that specific set of uh, components to expose other experimental features that are part of ContainerD, the, the engine, the runtime. So lazy loading snapshotters is a big area of investment and innovation as well as some of the other projects like image encryption that I mentioned. Um, you also get out of the box, uh, if you use Lima plus NerdCTL and ContainerD, you get rootless unprivileged mode. And if anyone has worked with rootless unprivileged uh, container runtimes, uh, it can get a bit complex to set that up yourself. Uh, you have to have some other uh, scripts that handle the uh, rootless networking and, and other pieces. And so Lima packages this for you by default and gives it to you out of the box. And so there's two other uh, popular projects that have built on the same stack. Uh, one is Colima. Uh, you can easily find it on GitHub. And then Rancher Desktop, initially created by Rancher, who are now under the uh, SUSE platform. Uh, SUSE acquired Rancher a few years ago. Both Colima and Rancher Desktop have built uh, development platforms on Lima using ContainerD and NerdCTL, um, as I mentioned. Next slide. So um, that brings me to another open source project that was just founded and launched last November. And so we have a team here at AWS who were, who, uh, contribute to ContainerD because we use ContainerD heavily in our cloud services at AWS. And looking for solutions for the same, same problem we started talking about right from the beginning. Uh, you know, thousands of developers using MacBooks, um, they want to develop and test in that sort of tight local development loop. Um, and so uh, looking at, at our contributions to ContainerD and the work that was happening around NerdCTL and Lima. And as I mentioned, uh, having BuildKit there as well, um, we decided that that same stack would be um, a great kind of building block on which we could build our own tooling uh, for this compatible command line for uh, developers to be able to uh, build, run, test, push and pull images to registries uh, on their own systems. And so we also uh, wanted it to be easy to get. So having releases through Homebrew and also Apple signed uh, installer releases uh, means it's, it's something that we can distribute very easily. You can install it with uh, almost a single click and supporting both um, the, the Mac Silicon, so ARM64 based and Intel based Macs. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, we, we started small, we wanted to, to get it out there to get feedback, uh, but we uh, would love and, and are looking at this year, adding an extension framework similar to, similar to ones you find in Docker desktop or Podman desktop, uh, allowing, you know, for example, partners to have image scanning extensions or extensions that maybe work with uh, cloud services or, or uh, cloud authentication frameworks. Um, and then the other important piece is that, you know, we started uh, focused on uh, sort of fixing our own problem, which was Mac OS centric, uh, but we are planning and would love uh, community help to also look at adding Windows and Linux support so that's kind of the, the core of what we launched uh, late last year. Uh, we continued to uh, develop it in the open. It's an open source project with a team here at AWS uh, working on it full time. And we're even 
looking and hoping for external contributors who even want to become maintainers of the project. Next slide. So, um, yeah, at this point, I, I was going to show off some commands. Now, um, if you've used Docker at all, um, maybe you'd say, well, it's not all that exciting because you're just typing the same commands, but putting Finch where you would put Docker. So, you know, Finch images to see the list of images, uh, you know, run a container with a command, pull a new image from a registry, like pulling the MySQL uh, latest container image from Docker Hub. So, you know, there's there's not, uh, there, the magic is not that you, you get the Docker commands. Uh, it's again, the, the uh, lack of any management you have to do of the, the VM um, and the lack of any um, work you have to do to handle passing through your home directory or extra directories you want mounted inside the VM uh, and the networking and sharing the ports back to your host system. Um, yeah, Chris, so I, you know, I, I'm trying to think, I, I had a, a little compose file that I was going to show, uh, but again, um, you know, I, maybe we'll just continue. And then if people have questions and want to see anything specific, uh, you can hop into your terminal and we can, we can try some things out, but for now, let's, uh, we can go on to the next, next slide. So, um, as I mentioned, Finch is not is not a replacement for any of these projects. We we uh, created it because we were already working upstream in ContainerD. Um, as we started to think about assembling a tool like this, we made some contributions to Lima. We've been actively working in NerdCTL, um, and again, you know, BuildKit is not part of the ContainerD project. Uh, but it's a very key project that is important to the build sus subsystem of not just Finch, but uh, many other projects, including the Docker engine now uses BuildKit. And we also work uh, in the OCI specs um, on features that are important to uh, future capabilities like attaching signatures and SBOMs to your container images. And so uh, when we think about collaborating uh, with others on Finch, it's not just our Finch repo that we care about, it's all these other projects that we wanna collaborate with uh, because they're the building blocks of not just Finch, but many other technologies and software projects uh, that are out there. Um, I, I mentioned this, but I, I wanna reiterate that uh, Finch is not an AWS project. It's not an AWS product. It's a community open source project that we started, uh, but we want to work on it in public with a public roadmap with external contributors. And it's been exciting to have some early contributions, but we would love to have more. Uh, I've already mentioned that, you know, adding OS support for Windows and Linux is high on our priority list. And then having this extension framework uh, because obviously a lot of, uh, just like with Docker desktop or Podman desktop, you know, one of the values is uh, being able to add other capabilities without having to change the underlying project itself. So, uh, for example, allowing uh, Aqua security or uh, any, or Datadog to uh, have an extension to plug in some of their capabilities uh, they don't want to add that directly into container D or the Finch project. Um, they want to be able to have an extension that works uh, for Finch or for Podman or for Docker. And so uh, that's another key feature that we think will unlock uh, a lot of extensibility uh, for Finch. Um, the GitHub project is here, uh, should be simple to find. We also have a Finch channel on CNCF Slack where we've had some good community uh, discussion with others, but uh, it's still very early days and, and would love others to drop in there and give us feedback. Um, I think we have, is the next slide just sort of a, a wrap up with some links? Yeah, okay. So um, there's a few more links here. Um, 
that Chris put together on, again, getting to the Finch organization. Um, we have a blog post that explains more that Chris and I participated in, in writing uh, about why we created it. That's uh, easy to find. And then again, a lot of this is based around our existing work in Containerd, not just myself, but uh, we have a container runtime team here at AWS that works upstream in Containerd and some of the sub projects. Um, and I'm easy to find online as well. If, if, if uh, there are future questions or you're interested to reach out on any of these topics. So I will stop there. Um, uh, Chris uh, is available if, if we want to look at anything uh, from a demo perspective, but also happy to, to answer any questions uh, that anyone would have. Okay, now's the time to uh, pop a question into the chat and let us know. Otherwise, I'll know that I perfectly explained everything. <laughs> There we go. Yeah, so um, great question, uh, Gerardo. Hopefully I got your name uh, correctly. Um, so, you know, there there are, well, I think the, the one of the ways to, to start this uh, answer is to recognize that, you know, people have favorite IDEs or, uh, you know, there's the classic VI versus Emacs, which maybe is, is less of an exciting war as it used to be when we have fancy, you know, VS code and, and cloud-based IDEs these days. Um, so <clears throat> we don't see Finch as a, as necessarily, um, you should pick Finch because, you know, item bullet points one, two, or three. There are people for whom the Docker ecosystem is perfectly fitted for what they want to accomplish. Um, for us specifically, um, you know, AWS has, as I'm sure many know, a, a fairly massive customer base who, uh, you know, pay to run their workloads on AWS. And many of those workloads today now run in containers. And if they're running it on Fargate or EKS, it's probably running in container D as the, the container runtime. And so Finch gives us that ability for those companies who also have um, a significant, you know, developer base who all have laptops and are, you know, building their applications in containers. Finch gives them a way to use the same technology that AWS is using when they run their workloads in production. And it also, you know, potentially for some of those customers, uh, they would like to make sure that if they have a problem talking to um, ECR public, a AWS's public container registry or their uh, ECR private registries, they know that if AWS are experts in Finch, uh, because we collaborate with others in the project, then we can help them, we can debug their issue. Uh, if they're using Docker or Podman, uh, they have to go seek out help from those communities. And so that's kind of our natural bent to have a tool that's built using a lot of the same components, but it's one that we have expertise in and it uses the same container runtime that we use in production and have expertise in. And so debugging you know, complex problems and, you know, giving developers a similar stack so that hopefully if there's some corner case issue, they can even see it locally um, as well as seeing it maybe in one of our production services. So that's a, a bit long-winded answer, but I think, um, you know, people, people choose the tools that make sense for their environment. Um, 
when people ask about Podman, for example, you know, I, I know most of that team because many of them worked in the upstream Docker and other container communities uh, for the same, you know, eight or nine years that I have. You know, they've created a, a set of tools that make a lot of sense because they're very well integrated with RHEL and Fedora and OpenShift. And so, uh, you know, it, it also can work for people who aren't in those communities, but maybe there's a more natural affinity um, in those communities because, uh, again, there's a similarity. OpenShift is using Creo, which is the same core libraries that um, Podman uh, uses as well. So, you know, that's kind of this, I, I think my answer around affinity for the communities you're in. Um, you also mentioned, so no Docker libs or binaries will be used. Yes, that's correct in the sense that um, when you install Finch, you're getting a Lima VM with container D installed inside on top of a lightweight Fedora uh, Linux OS image uh, with build kit. Uh, the only reason I'm being very precise is that Docker, if you install Docker, you also get build kit and container D and run C. So we're sharing, you know, common components, but there's no actual Docker, uh, Docker engine binaries or any components from uh, Docker involved in that sense. So I hope that covered i'm happy to follow up um, covered kind of your multi-part uh, question okay anyone else give you one more shot for a question <laughs> all right well uh phil and chris have you popped into the chat maybe any of your handles or slack channels so that um if anyone has any questions they can follow up on up with you um oh there we go richard yeah uh so um as i mentioned i think earlier in the presentation finch um, supports uh, both Apple Silicon and Intel. Uh, the cool thing about uh, QMU and some of the features in the Linux kernel is that you can target. Um, so again, you're building Linux containers uh, on your, you know, MacBook that is either Apple Silicon or Intel, but you can actually target. Um, either platform on Linux. So you can target Linux slash ARM64 or Linux slash AMD64 by using the dash dash platform flag in Finch, which is the same flag again that you would use with Docker or any of the other tools I mentioned. Um, so it, it supports um, both architectures and a cool added benefit of the uh, QMU static uh, support in the kernel is that you can essentially cross build uh, to either architecture. So, you know, if you have an ARM64 Mac, but your company, uh, you know, targets uh, Intel based CPUs in your production cloud scenarios, then you can build uh, Intel based 64 bit images and test them out. You can run them locally, but obviously then they would run uh, naturally in a Linux Intel environment in the cloud. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Chris put uh, some links there. Uh, we also have the um, Finch channel in CNCF Slack, so that's a great place to um, catch up with us. Uh, 20 minutes from now or two days from now, you're like, oh, I, I would <laughs> love to get an answer about this. We'll be happy to connect with you there as well. There you go. All right. Well, unless anyone has any other questions, we will 
wrap things up. All right. Thanks so much, Libby. And thanks uh, those that joined. And yes. again, happy to take other questions in the future. This was great. Thank you so much, Phil and Chris, for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for joining our webinar. It will be online shortly this afternoon. And uh, join us again for more online programs. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.